Steven. Hey, great. Great. How are you? great. How are you? Good. Good to you. Uh, happy New Year to you as well. Sorry we missed you last month, and uh, hopefully you had a enjoyable extended holiday and uh, everything is well in the Reichland household. Well, it was a very nice, uh, very nice holiday. Uh, it wasn't actually much of a break because uh, here in Reichlandia, I'm self-employed and I have a terrible boss, but uh, nonetheless, <laughs> it was a good transition. Good. Uh, well, we're happy to have you back here in 2019 and looking forward to a bunch of great monthly visits as we've done here. You know, I was trying to put a number to it. Uh, do, do you recall how many years we've been doing these monthly chats? I mean, has it been over five, six, seven years maybe? Uh, it's got to be four Jeez. or five years anyway. I'm telling you. So yeah. uh, always appreciate the time here. So um, I wanted to ask you a couple quick questions here before we got into uh, some of the other outline items that we had been talking about offline. In the second hour this evening, I'm going to be talking to a guy who has uh, some type of duck meat supply company. And it's specifically, now I'm going to say a name, and I'm not missaying it because it's going to sound much like another duck species. You're going to think mallard, but it's not mallard. It's molard. Okay. What about this duck? I mean, you have way more of an expansive palate than mine. I think we've shown that uh, during the history of our segments together. Uh, I'm assuming you've eaten duck before. So where does that rank on your overall list of things to eat? Well, I love duck. I mean, because duck has a very rich uh, flavor. Uh, the molar that you refer to has a gamey flavor, but you know, it's sort of if you imagine a steak that takes wing, uh, that's that's duck. I mean, it's it's like um, it's like steak that flies. It's a dark red meat. It's rich. It's sanguine. Um, uh, it's it's fantastic, and uh, I don't think many people cook it, uh, but it's great barbecued. Uh, it's great grilled and, you know, let's make this year the year of the duck. So is there a, a favorite way that you prepare it? Is it both of those? Or if you had to choose one or the other, is, is one going to lead? Well, you know, the duck that you've seen me do on Project Smoke is a perennial favorite. Uh, it's a sort of sweet, salty rub made with uh, salt, sugar, and Chinese five spice powder. Uh, the duck gets basted with uh, sesame oil. And then it is uh, smoked, uh, slow smoke for about two or three hours. I like to serve my duck medium to medium well, uh, which is breaks the mold of uh, France, you know, where I learned to cook. Um, but uh, and then it gets a what I call a pack rim or an Asian uh, barbecue sauce where you basically use hoisin sauce instead of ketchup. And that recipe is on barbecuebible.com. All course. right. Um, let me ask you another question here because this is a term that has been thrown around for years. Uh, I've kind of uh, stolen it from you and in conversation with other folks, I use this term smoke roast. And I yes. used it with a, a friend of mine the other day and he immediately texts back smoke roast question mark. And I said, don't you know what that means? And he said, no. And I said, well, this is a term that Stephen Reichlin, I think, has coined and been using it for years. I steal it from him, hence why I'm saying it to you now. So let me ask you to define smoke roast. So traditional smoking is done low and slow, right? About 225 degrees. It's the essence of true barbecue. Yep. Smoke roasting is done at a higher temperature, more like 350. It's what you do on a kettle grill where you set a grill up for indirect grilling. Uh, Smoke roasting, it's indirect grilling at a high temperature, but with, with smoke. I'll give you an example. Two nights ago, uh, I cooked a chicken. Uh, we spit roasted it, but we smoke roasted at the same time. Handfuls of pimento wood chips on the coals, indirect grilling, cooking temperature about 375 to 400, pretty high actually. You wind up with a dish that has the crackling, crisp skin, moist meat of, um, of roasting, but a smoke flavor. So would you say from a, a temperature standpoint, and I've really tried to, to get away from definitive rules and guidelines anymore, sure. especially here this year. But I mean, uh, typically when I'm saying smoke roast, I'm thinking right within that range, you said to 375 to 400, but, uh, and, and I'll do that on a pellet cooker, obviously, because it's generating wood smoke sure. uh, just because it's burning wood pellets. Sure. Uh, I would, for me, that magical temperature zone is uh, 350 to 400. Let's transition now to smoke, but something colder and with cheese, which is, by the way, is keto friendly. A cold smoking cheese is something that I have talked about. I've never done it. I've talked about people or I've talked 
about it to people and said, hey, here's a contraption you might want to think about, uh, this and that. But what do you know about cold smoking cheese, and, and do you like to do it? Well, if you actually look at today's blog on barbecuebible.com, that is the subject of the blog written by my incredible hmm. assistant, Nancy Lowski. And uh, it, it's smoked cheese, you know, smoked cheese. I call smoke the umami of barbecue. You know, it just makes every food taste better. And when you think about cheese, if you were to hot smoke it, you would melt it. So cold smoking is sort of required de rigueur in order to keep it from melting. Every smeak, every imaginable cheese tastes better smoked. I mean, mozzarella, which I like to smoke with hay, cheddar cheese, which I like to smoke with hickory. Uh, you can smoke provolone. You can smoke uh, smoke Swiss style cheeses, Gruyere. The whole key is to keep the temperature really low. Now, if you've got a smoker that where you can actually set it up for cold smoking, meaning the heat source is here, and the let's figure out how the hands go there. Uh, the smoke chamber is there, like Bradley, for example, mm -hmm. sells a cold smoking attachment. Or if you have a smokehouse, you can do this. Or if you're working, let's say, on a, um, a Weber Smoky Mountain, you put your cheese on a rack over a bowl of ice. That'll keep the chamber cool. And then that's another way to cold smoke. There are devices like the uh, Amazing Smoker uh, where you line it with chips or pellets. But the whole idea is you want to keep the cheese cold while you smoke it so it doesn't melt. Not to ask it, but by, by, by the way, if I yeah. may, in uh, my book, Project Smoke, there's a really cool technique from uh, Central Italy. It's called hay smoking, where you put cheese in any kind of smoker, uh, mozzarella usually, could even, be, uh, could even be a kettle grill or a smoky mountain. A big handful of hay or straw in the bottom, you light it, the straw catches fire and burns out within two minutes. So you don't really have enough time to catch heat. You get a great flavorful patina of smoke on the outside of the cheese. So that was, yeah. kind of leads right into the, the, the last part of this question that I was going to ask. When you are cold smoking, is there a different flavor to the smoke than if you would be running at a 225 to even you know 350 where I don't know if it's a perceived cleaner burn or if it is a cleaner burn is there a smoke taste difference? Well, that's an interesting question. And there is a smoke take di taste difference. Um, it's, uh, I mean, in a funny way, it's cleaner. But I think another kind of important point is that the food is not cooked. So often when we smoke, we're both smoking and cooking at the same time. You're getting chemical uh, interaction between the meat and the smoke. In this case, you're really laying a patina of smoke on the, uh, on the cheese. Anyway, check out Nancy's story. It's uh, it's very well done. All right, barbecuebible.com is the place to go to check out that story, by the way. Nancy, a local right here in Cleveland. Happy to have her. Thank you. Uh, you know, this time of year, Stephen, everybody likes to take stock of the year that has passed, 2018. Of course, beginning of the year, we always like to have you give your predictions and trends and all that stuff. So before we get into this year's look ahead, let's take a look back and Talk about some of the things that you saw that trended the way you thought, or maybe they ramped up, fizzled out, or things that maybe took you by surprise. How did 2018 look in review? Well, I think most of my predictions came true. I mean, Fusion Q was one of them. I think we've certainly seen kind of a fusion of East and West uh, in our barbecue. Philanthropy was another one where I talked about people doing uh, barbecue to, as fundraisers and to help people. Uh, that is certainly epitomized by uh, Operation Barbecue, a uh, great organization. Uh, I uh, predicted we'd be cook grilling more pork shoulder steaks. I think we saw that. Uh, more fiery dips like that. I did that piece on uh, Monroe County Barbecue for uh, the New York Times. Uh, I think one that I predicted that maybe hasn't happened yet, I predicted that veal would really kind of uh, blast off. And um, I, I think veal is still uh, very underappreciated, undereaten, but it's a uh, terrific meat. You know, I have seen in my Giant Eagle grocery store, which is, you know, whatever version, uh, maybe you're used to Price Chopper or Publix, maybe down in Florida or whatever, uh, but that's our version of whatever you're used to. There is a noticeable increase in veal in the meat case, which was not there a year ago. 
in, in a well, bunch of different ways. So, so my prediction was right. Yeah. Perhaps I even had uh, influence on it. Uh, Strauss Meats uh, does a terrific grass-fed veal. Um, the veal's a wonderful meat. You know, it's um, it's it, it's it's a lighter in flavor so uh, than beef. So it really picks up smoke flavors, fire flavors, spice flavors. I'm glad to hear that. All right. So let me quickly ask you this. This isn't something that I had particularly thought about asking you, but as I had mentioned, my palate is very narrow and in its experience. I've had veal parmigiana, but I've not had veal otherwise. So is there a, a cut that I should go for immediately and how should I cook it? Yes, Greg, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to that grocery store. Yep. I want you to buy yourself a nice two finger thick veal chop. All right. I want you to season it simply with coarse salt, freshly ground black pepper, chopped rosemary, a little lemon juice, and extra virgin olive oil. Mm -hmm. And I want you to grill it over a wood fire. And barring a wood fire, throw some wood chips on your charcoal grill or place a couple chunks of wood between the flavorizer bars of your gas grill. And grill it until the outside is just seared and crust the inside, little blush of pink inside. Drizzle of extra virgin olive oil mm. on top of it. I want you to do that. Then I want you to call me on my personal private <laughs> cell phone number, which you have, yes. and tell me what you think. All right. Well, I am uh, now challenged. I will come through. No doubt about it. I, I mean, a, a beefy resemblance or a flavor all of its own? Flavor all of its own. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to doing that. Uh, any other trends that uh, you saw come through or uh, I guess your your general 2018 barbecue year from start to finish? Well, I had a fantastic year in barbecue. In fact, uh, that was my uh, that was my January second blog was my year in barbecue. And then for me, it started at Camp Brisket uh, down at College Station, and uh, eventually Camp Brisket. Uh, well, that 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 was kind of the first step of research for my new book, The Brisket Chronicles, mm -hmm. which is coming out uh, February. Let's say I was working hard and heavy on The Brisket Chronicles. March, they uh, launched that Stephen Reichland Grills Italy show, uh, which was uh, really fabulous. Uh, April, I don't remember what I did in uh, April, but May, I was back at Barbecue University. Uh, June, I was on tour for Project Fire. Uh, July, we did the photo session for, um, for uh, the Brisket Chronicles book. August, uh, that was my month, uh, well, not my month, my few days off in August, but uh, we did a great, we always do this uh, annual beach barbecue in Chappaquiddick and Martha's Vineyard with some friends, so that was really fun. Yeah, it was a very, very busy year for me. You know, I, I go through the listings of stuff that you go through, you know, month by month to hit the highlight. Noticeably absent appearing on this show every month. What the hell? Uh, well, what the, what's a brother uh, got to do to get a shout out? I stand corrected, <laughs> and I promise next year, next year's uh, predictions, trends, it's going to be the monthly appearance on this show. All right, so let's go. Yeah, you do such a great job with the show. I, you know, I would think it's self evident. Yes, well, you know, ball busting is my specialty, so why not dole it out when I can? Uh, 2019 barbecue prediction since we're uh, starting to get into this year. What what do you think is going to take us by surprise? And also maybe what did you see trending up at the end of the year that you really think is going to hit its stride into this year? Okay, great question. Well, I mean, for me, this is the year of the brisket with the new book coming out. And I saw three brisket trends. So one was uh, brisket in places you never expect it. So you expect to find it in Texas and Kansas City. Great brisket in uh, Brooklyn. Great brisket in Chicago. Great brisket in Portland, Oregon. Even in Paris, I had some great brisket. Really? So I uh, think brisket has gone global. Brisket 24-7. I'm thinking of uh, the breakfast uh, brisket tacos at Valentina's in uh, Austin. Uh, brisket uh, noodle soup that's kind of fusion brisket also in Austin even brisket chocolate chip cookies really? in Austin. so all of those are going to be in the brisket book uh, another thing that I saw that uh, I'm kind of excited about it's uh, you know brisket sort of low and slow and the commitment of a half day is the mantra mm -hmm. well I uh, found a restaurant in New York and another one in Los Angeles, Korean restaurants, where they cook brisket in exactly one minute per side. And uh, I have disclosed the secret to doing this, wow. uh, but it's a really fantastic way to eat brisket. Some other trends, kind of speaking about Korea, I think we're still going to see a lot of Asian influence. You know, one of my trends was uh, Sri Racha's, the new ketchup and gojujang 
is the new chili sauce. Sri Racha, that hot sauce originally from Thailand, uh, you know, it's everywhere now. And gochujang is a chili paste from Korea. It's made with uh, chilies and soybeans and uh, sticky rice. And it's just fantastic slathered on meats, uh, whipped into mayonnaise. In fact, in the Brisket Chronicle, there's a, uh, a Texas-style brisket that's slathered with uh, gochujang before smoking. Hmm. Do you think that, uh, you know, I saw probably middle of the year quite a rise in this fascination with dry-aged beef uh, rolled right through the end of the year. Is this something that you think is going to start to trend down? I mean, I talked to Pat LaFrieda maybe a month ago, and he said 75% of his entire meat sales is devoted to dry-aged beef. I mean, and the amount of these dry-aging at one time is mind-boggling. Do you think it's something that will continue to trend up, or has it kind of hit its stride and will trend down? I think it will absolutely continue to trend up, as will wide you beef. Uh, oh. And I think, and I think what's happened, you know, is sort of on some level, um, beef steak is a commodity, and so anybody that would kind of with ambition and um, perseverance is going to want to find a way to distinguish their steak from the mass. And how do you do that? One, you do it by dry aging. Two. Uh, you do it by the breed of cattle, and this Wagyu has incredible marbling. And sometimes you'll see pictures of a Wagyu steak, and it looks like somebody laid a white lace, ta- uh, white piece of lace over a red tablecloth. Um, I think you'll s- continue to see uh, special cuts, little-known cuts, Spinellus. Uh, you'll see that. You'll see culotte. You'll see baseball steaks. Um, anything to differentiate from the mass. By the way, grass-fed steak is going to be a big thing. I also think that, you know, this adage, I've been saying this for years, but where your food comes from matters as much as how you grill or smoke it. Uh, Pedigree, you know, we'll have this yin-yang from the appeal of industrial meat because of the price versus the sort of purity, the sanity, the health, um, and the the, the just morality and good vibes of grass-fed beef of humanely raised animals. If you want to get the rest of the 2019 predictions, you go over to barbecuebible.com. If you want to see them here on this show, just tune in the third Tuesday of every month. It is Stephen Reichlin in his usual spot. Stephen, always appreciate the time. Thanks so much. Hey, thanks a lot. Great job. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. There he is, Stephen Reichlin.